Yes, it, in that sense, it was. I think it was very, very important for the development of the of the discipline. Uh, and you are uh, saying in this, uh, in the opening of this book, that uh, um, translation studies is part of uh, or something that it, it ca came out in the 80s. Yeah. So now in the nine, now we are in the 1990. We can say maybe that the, the discipline has been established. It, 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 I think, I don't even know if I would call translation studies a discipline. I think in this, I'm still ambiguous. But certainly translation studies had begun to be noticed. I think by the 1990s, there were journals beginning. Andre and I edited a series of books for Routledge, and then afterwards we took the series to Multilingual Matters. Um, we... I, I think, you know, there were people talking, Theo Hammond's book on the manipulation of literature, which came from another conference, had come out in 85. Okay. So people were talking about the cultural turn, the manipulation school. There was a lot more interest in translation in comparative literature circles. So things had started to happen, really. The, 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 and also, journals were being published. Um, there were quite a lot more conferences. And I began to see a rising number of students interested in studying translation. And I think that's another point. But I also have a theory as to why that happened in the 1990s, which has nothing to do with books. So what does it have to do with? It has to do with major world political events. Mm. It has to do with the collapse of the Berlin Wall in 1989, the opening up of China to the West and the end of apartheid in South Africa. Because those are three, there were three huge constraints. In the 1980s, you had an apartheid regime, which not only had an impact in South Africa, but across the whole continent of Africa. China was pretty well closed, certainly in terms of regular traffic students moving. And of course, Eastern Europe was closed. And then all of a sudden, by 1995, you've got this huge opening. And so at this point, you've got millions, literally millions more people moving. They're moving for economic reasons, they're moving for pleasure, they're moving for discovery. And so you've got this enormous, enormous change in the world. And you can see it in every airport in every, I mean, one, one of the, the, the things I, I remember sitting two or three years ago, sitting with friends in, in Copenhagen um, in the sunshine in a bar, and next to me was two young Chinese men who are meeting someone from Italy. And on another table, there's an Australian who's talking to a Russian. There's, all of a sudden, you have this extraordinary cultural interchange. And that means that people are bringing languages, they're bringing cultural expectations in totally new ways. And so I think that has had a big, big impact on why people have come to see translation as important. Yeah, I see. And then you speak about, not more about Europe, but you speak about the world. Yes. The world has changed. And then uh, uh, we have a new uh, encounter between translation studies and uh, post-colonial studies. Uh, and you are part of that game too, since you, in 1999, published the book uh, on po post-colonial translation uh, together with Harish Triveri. Yes. Because, you see, that, that also interested me, and I was very, very lucky, really. I went, I went to China in 1988 for the first time, and I was in Beijing, and I was in northern China. And um, at that point, people from the West were so rare in the outlying areas. I remember when I was up in Shenyang, uh, children would come up and touch me in parks because they hadn't seen a blonde woman before. So because China was still so closed. And also in the 1980s, I had begun to meet, I mentioned Vladimir Matsura, I could mention a number of other Czech friends and so on. I'd begun to meet people. And so I had gone 
to Eastern Europe. Also because some of the very early excellent work in translation studies was um, Anton Popovich and Yiji Levy and so Czech and Slovak writers. So I'd actually had a fellowship at one point from the British Academy to go to Prague. And many of my colleagues in literary studies in the UK were not interested in going to remote areas of China or to Eastern Europe. They wanted, you know, to go to Princeton or whatever. So I was going east and they were going west. And then after 1989, all of a sudden, the world changed. And a whole load of the people that I had known suddenly became professors, heads of department, were organizing things in the East. And I remember writing an article for, um, I think it was the Journal of Women's Studies, which is called How I Became an Expert on Eastern European Women Overnight. Because it was just that all those years of talking to people, and also I had, you know, I had some check as well. So being able to talk to people suddenly meant that, that, that again, the world had changed and I was kind of involved in it. And so um, I was very interested to see what happened in, certainly in China, there was this huge, as they, as they moved more towards opening to the West, huge translation boom, which is still going on. And then partly because I was so interested in that part of the world, I traveled for the British Council in Bulgaria, in Turkey, in Uzbekistan, in Kazakhstan, you know, in, in a number of remote places in the early 90s. And then I had this wonderful invitation to go to India and to chair a project on translating South Indian languages, which was called the Oak and the Banyan Tree. And out of this, of course, then I began to, to learn so much more about, um, well, about South India and about Indian languages generally and the role of translation. And I'd known Harish Trivedi since 1985 when I'd invited him to Warwick. Mm. When he came, he was working, he was in, in Birmingham with his wife who was doing a PhD and we just met. And so then it seemed very logical that we would put together our shared interest by then in what was happening outside Europe and look at post-colonialism and translation. So that was another book that just grew organically like translation, history and culture had. I, I, th I think all my books have developed, I say organically, very logically from what I happened to be doing at that particular moment in time. And the collaborations have been very logical collaborations. I mean, Andre and I wrote a book together that came out in 1998, um, Constructing, Constructing Cultures. Culture. And that, again, was a very, very logical collaboration. So all the collaborations have been entirely, yeah, in keeping with what I happen to be interested in. Mm. And it seems to me that they are very parallel to what has happened to translation studies. You were very uh, good in timing, or by accident, or uh, maybe also because you opened up doors, and then uh, uh, scholars in the in the what we can could call the discipline. We shall maybe discuss that afterwards. Um, what was happening? You were there. Uh, you were working with people that. Uh, you were opening doors together with people in the in the right moment also for the reflection for the work in translation studies and one of uh, and later work also collaborative with the uh, Esperanza Bielsa on translation in global news going out of the context of uh, literary translation mm -hmm. and really see what is where is really the translation going on yes it's going on because we travel, because the world has changed, but, but in the medias, that's really where translation is taking place, where uh, they are discussing the politics and uh, the, the change in our world, not only uh, literature. And that was only a yeah. new important step for, uh, for translation studies. I think, that if I can just take you up on two things there. One is, I, I believe very, very strongly that as, as an academic, it has been my responsibility and duty to help younger scholars. 
and also if you like to talent spot. So when Andre and I were, were editing our series for Radcliffe, we were looking all the time. You know, Sherry Simon's book on gender and translation was because we met Sherry Simon and we thought, oh my goodness, this woman is terrific. And I mean, you look at what she's writing now and you can see how over 20 years that's developed. Michael Cronin was another one. I was sent a manuscript many years ago by Cork University Press to assess and I read this and I thought, gosh, here's a really, really bright mind. Edwin Gensler, you know, the, the, so a whole load of people kind of came, I came into contact with them and because of the advantage of editing a series of books or organising conferences or whatever, I was then able to invite them to do things. And I think that's also important, that, that, that you have a bit of faith in people. And the collaboration with Esperanza was, again, um, that was a book that came out of um, a, an award from the um, Arts and Humanities Research Council, which basically employed Esperanza for three years. She was the research fellow on that. And she was a sociologist, um, a, a marvelous young Catalan scholar who'd, who'd also done a lot of work on Latin American uh, media. And so that was how that book came about. But again, I think it's a timely book and I'm interested in how the Arabic and Chinese editions are supposed to come out any time now. I haven't seen them yet, but the contracts have been signed. And there's a lot more people now working in this because this is an area that, again, if you go back 20 years, I've talked about the political side of things, but you could also say, you know, in, in 1989, when the Berlin Wall came down, we didn't have the internet. Hmm. And now we've gone not only to the internet, but we've gone to 24-hour breaking hmm. news. And so one of the questions, I think, which is hugely important now, is we've always had this, this issue about whether you trust translators. Because in one sense, you have to trust them. Because if you don't know the other language, you've got to trust the person translating for you. But with the news, this is terribly important. So what, what the project, what Esperanza and I started to do was to look at how, how the news arrives to us. If you think of what's been happening in Libya lately, you know, how, how does the information from some of those very isolated places arrive on our television screens and in our newspapers. And of course the answer is that it goes through the most incredibly complicated processes of interlingual transfer from one language to another, but not only interlingual transfer, but very complex processes of editing, reshaping, what we would call manipulation. And so by the time you get your quotation from someone who has been on who, who has been there for example who saw Gaddafi shot my goodness it's gone through so many transformations and so the question of trust and authenticity and veracity thinking of Habermas and the whole veracity debate that becomes very very important and I think that will grow in importance because not only do we have so much happening interlingually now but we're having it done at a, such a fast pace that the possibility of checking, double checking, verifying is not there as it was even a few years ago. And so that's important. 